Hey guys, welcome to A-Level Chemistry and Physics. Today we will be covering matter and materials, which is a part of the AS level physics syllabus. And yeah, let's jump right into it. We will cover a few topics that we have done before. Okay, one of them is density, a, con a concept which you are very familiar with. Right, by definition, density is mass per unit volume. The formula for density is mass divided by the volume. And the SI unit for density is kg per meter cube. Again, I'm not talking uh, in great detail about it because I'm pretty sure you're aware of what density is. This is just a quick revision. Pressure. Right? Any object that is in contact with another object exerts a force on it. Pressure, by definition, is defined as the force acting per unit cross-sectional area. Right? F over A, as you can see in the slide. The unit for pressure is Newton per meter square or pascals, right? So pressure in fluids. In solids, when let's say a block is sitting on a table, the only force the block exerts on the table is the surface, surface they're in contact with. That is only downwards. Because the only force that the solid is capable of exerting is its own weight. On the other hand, when there are fluids like liquids or gases, because their particles are loosely packed, they keep changing position and direction constantly hitting the walls of the container they're in. Therefore, they exert pressure on all surfaces on the, in the container they're in. This pressure depends on three things. The height below the surface, that means if you're on the surface of the earth, the further down we go into the ocean, the pressure increases, the density of the fluid and the acceleration due to gravity, G, right? So we will now derive the formula, one you're familiar with, pressure is equal to rho GH. Right. I assume you already know this. So as we talked, we said right that uh, pressure is proportional to these three things. So pressure is equal to rho into g into h. So now we look. Let's look at this container. Right. There the volume of the 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 main pressure is being exerted on this surface, which is also the cross section of the water as well as the container. Right. The volume of the water is area of cross section, which is A, into the height it is filled up to, which is H. So volume is A into H, right? When we find the mass of the water, mass is density into volume, because density is mass over volume, we make mass the subject of the equation. So density into volume, we found that volume was A into H. So density into volume, and density is A into H, so mass becomes rho into A into H, right? So that is the mass. Then we talk about the pressure is force upon area, right? So force is not the mass, but the weight of the water. Weight is mass into G. The mass is rho into A into H. And the, once you multiply that with G, we get the weight of the water to be rho into A into H into G. The pressure by definition is force over area. Right, so we found the force, which is the weight of the water, as can be seen here, divided by the area. So once you put rho into A into H into G divided by A, the two A's cancel each other out, and we get rho into G into H. If you uh, think I went too fast, you can go back and revisit the explanation until you've got it. Also, this derivation comes very often. So it is better if you know this like the back of your hand. And Hooke's law. Um, this is a concept we know from our previous classes already, but it is very important right now because you will build on this concept to another one, which we'll also uh, examine in the next slides. Okay, so by definition, a material obeys Hooke's law if the extension produced is proportional to the load applied across it until the elastic limit. Right, so if there is a load being applied uh, to a spring for that is a hanging for example so you hung a spring you add loads different loads of different masses and then you measure the extensions if the increase if the extension is proportional to the uh, increase in load then uh, the material obeys Hooke's law right we'll examine the graph so the graph we have f on the y-axis extension on the x-axis and this graph right so Typically, the graph that obeys the Hooke's law is a linear, a straight line coming from the origin. 
extending to a point A after which it becomes curved and irregular. So the point A is again the elastic limit. If uh, the spring is stretched beyond this limit, it becomes deformed and does not follow any sort of proportionality anymore. The graph that is important to us is this straight line. You can see that the gradient gives us a value k, right? What is this value k? We'll come to that in a second. So, right. Uh, also, we have, there's an important um, distinction to this graph. The conventional way of plotting the results is having the independent variable on the x-axis and the dependent variable on the y-axis. Right? The independent variable is what we are changing and the dependent variable is what changes due to the change we induced in the system. Right. So if, um, if there is an equation involving time, time is always the independent variable, right? We cannot change time. Time changes something else. So time is always the independent variable on the x-axis and the dependent variable on the y-axis. That is the traditional way of doing things. In this case, the force is the independent variable and the extension is the dependent variable. Therefore, the graph should be force on the x-axis and extension on the y-axis. But in this case, we flip this on its head. We do not do this a traditional way. We instead take force on the y-axis and extension on the x-axis. This is done for a very specific and important reason. Okay, that is because the um, this is a departure from the convention because the gradient of this of the linear section of the graph gives us a very very important quantity, which is known as the force constant of the spring. Okay, the, what is the force constant of the spring? We'll come to the definition, but for for you to understand, a force constant is basically the constant of proportionality between force and extension, right? So force, so the extension is directly proportional to the force, but for a proportionality to become an equation, we have to introduce a constant, right? So that constant is this constant of, uh, is this force constant that we just talked about, right? So the uh, when force is directly proportional to extension, we change it into a change it into an equation where the equation becomes f is equal to kx, where k is a spring constant. So, what is the force constant? The, the sorry, the spring constant or this force constant is called both. This constant is force per unit extension, right? Because if there is f is equal to kx, you make k the subject, it becomes f divided by x, force per unit extension. Okay, the SI unit for the force constant is newtons per meter or n divided by m. The force constant is just finding the gradient of this linear section. As I explained before, gradient is equal to k. Right? How does k change? So the stiffer the spring, the higher the value of k. If uh, there, are, there are two springs and one of them requires a much greater load for the same amount of extension, it will have a higher value of k and vice versa. Again, this is not the value of k is not no more a constant after the elastic limit because the spring becomes deformed. Now we come to three new properties, right? Stress, strain and Young's modulus. These three will require knowledge of Hooke's law and we'll come to that come to, we'll explain and understand all these three right now. So what is their origin, right? Why do we study these properties? Each material has a different property, right? Silicon can be softer than, let's say, aluminum, right? Some are more denser. Some materials are denser than others. Some are more malleable than others. Some are easier to stretch than others. However, the same material will have the same properties no matter its form or shape, right? So magnesium, uh, aluminum will be equally dense no matter what shape it's in. It can be a rod, it can be a spring, no matter, but the density will always hold constant. However, if there are, so uh, as an extension of the same constant, uh, the concept, if there are two springs, which are of the exact same material, but they have, so if out of the exact same material, there is, should be one property that holds true for both of them, irrespective of shape, length, thickness, so on and so forth. This, what is this property is what we're going to investigate. So we first come to stress. Stress in all, almost all respects is exactly identical to pressure. Stress by definition is force per unit cross-sectional area of a wire. 
formula is also exactly the same f over a where force is in newtons is the cross sectional area in meter square and the unit is also same either in newton per meter meter square or we can also use pascals the only the only reason the terminology changes is because we are talking about extension load and so on and so forth that's why the term pressure becomes stress in all other respects stress and pressure are exactly identical strain so strain is defined as the fractional increase in the original length of the wire Right, so if the original length of the wire is 10 centimeters, you apply a load, right? The extension is 2 centimeters. The strain will become extension over original length. The extension is 2 centimeters, original length is 10 centimeters. So the strain becomes 1 over 5 or 0 0.2. Right, the formula is also x over l. The variables have been described. Note that strain does not have a unit. Right, since both of the, vari the variables used to calculate strain, x and l, are the exact same quantity, length, the units in both cases cancel each other out because it's division. And because also uh, on a, another on another way of remembering this is that strain is a ratio and ratio never has a unit. Young's modulus, right? This is where the investigation more or less culminates, right? We can now find the stiffness of the material we are stretching. Right. Instead of calculating the ratio of force to extension, as we usually do while finding K or the string constant, for example, we calculate the ratio of stress to strain. And this ratio holds constant for a particular material and does not depend on its shape, uh, shape size, volume, thickness, so on and so forth. This value or this ratio holds constant for a material no matter any other physical properties. This ratio of stress to strain is known as the Young modulus of the material. The Young modulus for a material always holds. So this is the formula. We talked about ratio, so it is division, stress over strain. There are two symbols used, sigma and epsilon, uh, for stress and strain respectively. These almost never come, so you don't have to memorize these. You just have to remember the formula and you should be good, good to go. The unit for Young modulus is exactly the same as for stress, Newton per meter square. This is mainly because strain, which was a ratio, has no unit in itself. So Young modulus and stress have the same unit. It can be used, uh, the Young modulus can have many other values, uh, many other units used, megapascals or gigapascals. I assume you already know the conversions between the different units, so I will not cover that right now. So how do we find a Young modulus? The most efficient way of finding the value of a ratio is again plotting a graph. Like in Hooke's law, we are also drawing a graph over here. We, uh, since Young modulus is stress over strain, stress will come on the y-axis, strain will come on the x-axis, and the gradient of the linear part of the graph will give us the Young modulus. We'll come to the graph in a second. So this is the graph, right? The y-axis is stress, x-axis is strain. Do note that after a point, again, the graph curves like the graph we saw before. This is because only the linear region observes Hooke's law. And the gradient, as you can see, gives us Young modulus. That, uh, remember, finding the gradient of a graph is always better than just using one value of stress and strain and then finding the Young modulus because there is a chance for error. Once you plot a graph and use any two random points, it becomes much easier. Now we come to a different topic, elastic potential energy. So whenever we pull a string in order to extend it, we do work on the string. This happens because we are again applying a force and the spring moves in the direction of the application of the force, right? So work is being done on the spring. We talked about in the video work power and energy that work is always equal to energy, right? If you do work on an object, there is some energy transferred to it. And if an object does work, it loses energy. So it follows that once you do work on the spring to pull it, some energy is transferred to it. This energy is known as elastic potential energy. This energy is stored and you see the release of this energy as soon as you see the spring, you let the spring go. So once you're holding the spring, as soon as you let it go, you see it move about, oscillate, and basically wobble all over the place, right? Because the elastic potential energy gets converted to kinetic energy. 
some of this energy can be restored. So if you pulled it to a certain length, let it go and then pull it to the same length again, chances are the elastic potential energy stored in the spring is almost 100% the same as before, right? Because most of the elastic potential energy is recoverable. Obviously, this does not hold true again if the spring has been stretched beyond the elastic limit where it cannot regain its original shape. This energy can also be measured by using a graph. Right, so we talk about the graph first and then we'll come to the pointers. So the graph, right, it is again force over extension, typical Hooke's law graph. So we know work done is force into extension, right? Force and extension are over here. In a graph, the work done when force and extension are on the axis, the work done is always the area under the curve, right? In this case, it's a triangle. So the area under the curve is half into x into f. Into f half into base into height. So elastic potential energy becomes half fx. Again, this is also a very important formula, comes very often. Please, uh, you should know this like the back of your hand. Another formula. So uh, we derive another formula that may help us in certain situations where you don't have one variable, right? So we derived the formula half fx. But we know from Hooke's law that f is also equal to kx, where k is the spring constant, x is the extension. So in case we don't know the force, but we know the spring constant and the extension, we can just replace F is equal to Kx in the equation for elastic potential energy. So half Fx becomes half into Kx, Kx being force, into X. So elastic potential energy also becomes half Kx square. This is the equation you can use if you don't have the force that is being applied on the spring, and you can still calculate the elastic potential energy. Right, guys, thank you so much for listening. This is the end of the video. Um, if you have any suggestions on how to improve the videos or some doubts, uh, any suggestions are welcome in the comments below. If you have any doubts, there is my email ID in the description of the video. You can shoot me an email. I'll help you out, no problem. And do hit the subscribe button because we need to get, get these free videos out to as many people as possible. Thank you so much for, work, uh, for watching. Keep working hard and see you in the next video. Bye-bye.